Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you guys are doing okay. <clears throat> Welcome back to our BCH 2024 course. Um, so before we continue with the lectures, a couple of things. Any, any questions about um, the current assignment, the visualization assignment? I know you guys are working already on that. Um, I think Shada has a really good question. I just answered a few minutes ago on the um, uh, on the forum, uh, and I appreciate the, the question, Shada, because I think many of you you decide to use uh, your own data or or any particular data set that you need to load. You will run into this. So um, I would say. Uh, First of all, try to put the data on the same directory as the script. That might not be the case if you are you doing this in your in your own work, but for the assignment sake, uh, we need to reproduce your your plots. So having them there is easy and it won't break anything in the script. And the second thing is uh, remember to upload the data when you submit the uh, the assignment, so I can actually run your scripts and reproduce the plots. Sina is asking, are we allowed to use CC plots for parts one and two? Yes, yes, yeah, sure. I, I think I mentioned this last class. Uh, CC plot or CC plot two or whatever is your your favorite plotting library is okay. Having said that, I will I will um, evaluate or or uh, look at the assignments following the uh, the criteria I mentioned uh, during the professional looking plot. So, white spaces should be shrink. Uh, you may or have to maximize the utilization of the real estate in the in the plot. Um, all the things that we discussed last class, right? So yes, you you are you are free to do that. Um, if you are going to use any other package like ccplot or anything like that, I think I mentioned this uh, also for previous assignments, do not install the package in your script, load it. Use the library command, but don't, do not use the install.packages uh, command. Okay, is that, that clear? If, if I need any special package that I don't have, I will install it. You can make a note in your script saying this, this um, function or this utility drive or this main driver script needs this package, um, but this usually is, is um, it's not a good idea to put install packages in your in your scripts because it, it can be seen as a, a little invasive on the on the user space. Okay. Um, any other questions? I'm still looking at your assignments. Um, what was that? assignment number four? I hope to have them finish it by maybe, I, I don't think today, but maybe tomorrow sometime. Um, I, will, I will send you an email when the grades are done. Um, the other thing is this is our, so we, we have this and one more lecture to go, so almost at the end. I think I mentioned to you a couple of times, um, I haven't heard anything from you guys, but uh, my plan is to do high performance R as the last lecture. I could easily do some classification algorithms if people is interested, like decision trees or k means something like that. Um, so maybe I, I will post something on the forum. So if you guys have any preferences, I, I put a couple of topics and you guys let me know. If not, we, we can do, I, I think it's either way, high performance are how to make your, your scripts run a little bit faster or how to profile them or how to use uh, different techniques if you are, um, Starting for memory or particular resources, or maybe do some sort of machine learning neural network thingy. Um, but again, if you guys have any any particular preference, uh, please let me know. Okay, I will I will post something in the forum so you guys can answer that or reply to that if you prefer or email me whatever. All right, so let's let's continue with um, the last the last part of the material for the visualization. Uh, section of the course. And what we're going to be seeing today is animations and interactive plotting. I, I, I think this is a fun, fun topic and uh, hopefully we can see some live demonstrations. Let me start by sharing my screen. That would be useful. There we go. Windows back. So, okay, here we go. 
uh, and again, if you guys have any questions about um, what we covered last last class about the professional plotting, please feel free to to ask. Okay. So we're going to be talking about animations, and animations is a cool a cool thing to include in presentations whenever you are giving a talk or or uh, even your defenses. Um, and of course, it depends a lot on on the field that you work with. But many many or most of the scientific fields can can um, represent data with animations. And, and and if you think about it, the animation is nothing else than an additional dimension that you add to the representation of the data. Of course. This makes sense in particular if that extra dimension that you add has a smooth transition between the different, the different values, the different degrees that you add to this dimension. The usual case is to represent the animation as a function of time, meaning as the time passes by, as the time flows, as the, as the time variable progresses, then you represent the, the updated data. Uh, and this is the, most, the, the case for most of the of the animations or the typical animations, but in principle, you can decide to, to basically scroll through a different variable. So let's say you have X, Y, and Z, and you decide to represent the set variable as the flow of that variable. So you represent, you, you show X and Y as the set variable changes. So animations in principle, or, or the most typical um, paradigmatical case that you will see is, is a variation in time. But don't don't get restricted to that. You can even scroll through different variables through different fields. In any case, I'm going to show you a very artificial example um, of random dots. Basically, uh, uh, dots x number of dots, ten dots that will randomly vary the location in x and y position, and we're going to represent that. So a few a few observations about animations. Animations or movies in general are nothing else than the consecutive display of frames, meaning static plots of a given quantity. And if you, if you make the, the transition, the, the display of the consecutive frames in a given amount of time, then that gives you the, the, um, the feeling, the sensation that this is a, is a smooth thing. And that is nothing else than a movie. Basically, movies are created in that way. And this is what we're going to do with this script I'm showing you. So um, we're going to be using the animation package. Um, and then we're, the, the animation package provides some functions, say GIF, say HTML, say SWF, uh, video, that are possible outputs for the type of animation of, of movie that you will generate. Um, now, a couple of things. The animation package is not a standard package. You, so you will need to install the animation package to enable to produce animations. And the other thing is it, the animation package will generate this sequence of frames I was talking about, but then it will pass the sequence of frames to a third or a second program, uh, which is called an encoder. And that one is the, is the actual one in charge of generating the movie. Now, my recommendation, because it's one of the, the ones that works the best to use across different platforms and across different operating systems, meaning Mac OS, Windows, and Linux, is to use FMPEG. But there are other ones like PN3, uh, PN3, SWF. Um, basically, these packages are called encoders and they ensemble um, the animation at the end. It's, it's, tra it's transparent to us. We don't need to know how they work, but you need to have them installed as well. Okay. Um, so this is, this is an example script again. Uh, we are going to start by loading the animation package. And then we are going to consider our 10 points or 10 particles, whatever you want to call it. Then the, the animation package has several options that you can control. One of the options I, I'm setting here is the delay, delay between frames. And that is standard times. Uh, this is five milliseconds, which is a standard time. It gives you the, the, the sensation in your eye, in, your, in, in the view of the frames, that is very, very continuous. The flow is continuous enough. But you can play with that. If you want to have a very high resolution or, or fast moving uh, movie, you can control that as well. And the command is very simple. It's just one command. It has a funny notation. We're going to see why in a second. Uh, in this case, it's called save video. Then it's a function. So we open the parentheses that close here at the last line, as you can see. And then we initialize the position. So in this case, because I say we are going to consider 10 points or 10 particles, uh, we are initializing the, the coordinates X and Y on the same line with zeros. So all of the particles, the 10 particles, begin um, 
at the origin of coordinates. And then what we're going to do is we're going to repeat this for n times, in this case, 200 times, meaning that our simulation or our movie, in this case, we had 200 frames, okay? Which will just give you a few seconds because if you multiply this by 0.05, um, it's, it's, it's just no more than one second or so. So uh, what we're going to do after is we are going to update the positions of the 10 points randomly. So for doing that, I'm going to take the X coordinate and I'm going to add to the X coordinate just a particular factor times the random number generated from the normal distribution and we get 10 of these. So what, what the X vector represents is the 10 coordinates for each of the points, X1, X2, X3, up to X10. And then the Y vector represents the Y coordinates for the corresponding points, okay? So we, we randomly update this and then the other thing we're going to do is just use the plot command as we saw before, plot X and Y. Now, the funny thing with the animations is it looks nice and it looks like you are actually creating a movie of a particular spot in a space in this case, if you fix the limits. Because remember the plot command will try to make the plot or make the, the data fix uh, or fit the largest point. So it will adjust automatically your limits. But if we adjust the limits, if we keep the limits fixed in this particular case, then it will give you the sense that this is a, a, a fixed frame, a fixed region in the X, Y plane. Then we put uh, a particular type of point. So they, they look like a little bit bigger, PCH19. And this closed the for loop. So we are looping over 200 iterations in this case. And then we close the function and the last argument to the function is called video name. So the, the, the name of the video we want to produce, in this case, I call it dots.pm4. Now, this is a script. You run this script or you run these commands, however you want to see it. And at the end, you should get a file called dots.mp4, uh, which is the movie for the, for the dancing points, as you would see in a second. So what this description it is, I show you in a second, is, is the following is this animation. So this is 10 points at the start of the origin. We're going to play that again. And then they start to, to vary their positions randomly um, as, 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 as the number of iteration continues. It's hard to see, uh, but the, the very first frame of this animation is all the 10 points originated at 0, 0. Let's do it again. And then as the, the coordinates are updated, they are starting to oscillate to barbarians. So this can represent, you know, random walks, it can represent uh, um, particles, colloidal particles in a fluid, those kind of things, a diffusion process if you wish as well. Okay. So it's quite simple in principle to, to produce this kind of things. So a couple of, of notes about animations. I, I mentioned this, the animation is not a standard podcast, so you need to install it. Animation depends on these tools that we were talking about, the encoders or assemblers of, of the animations. So you will need to install uh, some of these. Again, the FF, FMPEG is, I think, one of the, the best ones. It's very powerful. It's, it's a really powerful uh, encoder machinery. Um, it's not too complicated to install. It's not just GUI uh, guided, let's say, but the installation is, is simple. And if you run into any issues, just let me know. Um, there are some, some um, technical comments in some cases, depending how you render the animation, the rendering is the process of ensembling the animation and, 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 and producing the animation. But depending how you do that, um, FMPEG or whatever is the encoder may decide to put things in memory and then from the memory dump it into the file in, in, in this. Um, if you do something like PNGs, uh, which in principle will generate each each frame as a PNG object, as a PNG file, then you won't run into memory limitations. But that's something to consider depending on your hardware, hardware limitation. This, I, I think I mentioned the, the syntax is a little bit um, funny with the say video function. You see it's a function, so start with the curly parentheses and then open the bracket, the curly bra uh, braces. And that is because this is indeed a function. So in principle, you can put a function there and, and it will basically execute that function for rendering things. Okay. But in, as I say, it's quite simple, quite straightforward, I would say to produce movies uh, and, and they look nice. They, they, you probably need to, to tweak things a little bit, but they, 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 they do their job. 
Okay, any, any questions about animations or movie simulation? No? Okay, okay. Uh, so let's now move into another interesting topic, uh, interactive visualization or, or plotting. So let me tell you about two, these are interesting or, or, or useful, I believe, because it, it, it contributes to this sense or idea of uh, data inspection, data manipulation. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of everything. So these are two functions that comes with R. So you don't need to install anything in particular. Uh, it's called locator and identity. And these two interesting functions, what allow you to do is to actually go and in a plot, identify points. So in this example, I have just 10 points, again, X from one to 10, Y from 14 to 23, and we just plot them. A typical plot, dot, dot points uh, in an X, Y, um, plot. Now, if I use the locator function and then I, I, I click twice on each of the points or, or whatever, it will give me the coordinates of those points. So it can tell me where in the plot I located. Uh, and you can do this as many times and then you right click uh, or a particular combination of, of clicks if you're in your mouse pad. Uh, the identity function, which takes the points, the same data points, what tell you is, uh, so you click again a couple of many times and then right click again. What it tells you is uh, where you click at the closest to the data point and it returns the index of that data point. Okay, so these two functions are useful to identify. Okay, if I have some data there and I click in a particular spot in the plot, uh, okay, which is the closest data point I have, the index of that particular point. And the look, that's the identity identify function. The locator function will tell you is the actual point where do you click on top of the point or on top of the plot. So it tells you the X, Y coordinates in the representation of the X, Y data, of course. Okay. So these are two basic and, and, and sometimes useful functions if you want to explore data or, or, or basically give, get an idea of a particular plot. But the real, the real uh, cherry on top of the cake is for me at least is this plotly library. So I'm going to spend the rest of the lecture today uh, talking about this plotly library. Um, it's a super powerful library. It's, it's a graphics interactive library. Uh, it generates very nice looking and interactive plots. And, and, and what I mean with interactive in the sense that you, you will see, I will, I will try to show you a, a real uh, hands-on demonstration with this. But the idea here is it will, so when you create a plot in, in R, either with Shishi plot or the basic plotting capabilities of R, with the exception of, of these functions, um, maybe, we can, maybe we can start doing uh, the light demo right now. Let me, let me try that. So let me put this on the side. So Okay. This one here. So I'm going to launch R here in my terminal. I hope that you guys can see this. And I'm going to do, okay, going, let me define uh, one to 10 here and then Y being um, 11 to 20. Okay. And then I'm going to do plex plot X, Y. And okay, my plot should appear somewhere. Um, you guys see my plot? I'm not exactly sure if it's showing my terminal. Okay, I'll put it here. Okay, so it's a static plot. No, nothing too profound about this. It's the, it's the usual plot that you guys will produce. Now, if I show you a locator, as I was mentioning before, now what happened is now I have a cross on top of my plot. It's still a static, right? But I can, I can click and click and then do right click to stop the process. And what it does, it returns the coordinates. It returns two vectors where the places I click. But the plot is still static in the sense that not much has happened on the plot. I, can, I cannot change things. I cannot zoom into regions. I cannot display things. I, I, basically, it's a static plot. That's what I mean with static plots. What, what um, 
what Plotly will allow us to do, and let me see if I can go back to this, what Plotly allow us to do is to manipulate, interact with the plot and the data on the plot itself. So that's, that's where we're going with, with this uh, library, with this tool. How it does that? Well, it does that by generating uh, HTML documents. So HTML documents are hypertext, uh, multi-language documents are the documents that our browsers uh, self in the web, self in the internet can display. So it will be open it in a browser. Uh, underneath there are some technicalities. The way it does this is by generating what is called a JavaScript call and requires JavaScript plotting library. But again, you don't need to know that because the browser will take care of this, okay? Now, one of the things, and again, these are some technicalities, plot list based on the plot list JavaScript library, which is built on top of D3.js and StackShield. These are JavaScript libraries that are well known and well used in, in the web world, uh, if you wish. So plot list is nothing else but a high level declarative charting library. Uh, that we can use through different languages. It's not only restricted to R, it can work in R, Python, MATLAB, even Excel, if you wish, okay? Um, they have a lot of documentation online. It's open source. It's, it's, it's a Canadian um, initiative. It's, it's based on Montreal, actually. Uh, so it's, it's a really cool tool I, I, I have found during the years. Uh, as I say, it works with many different languages, so it can be considered a, a API and application program interface for Python, R, MATLAB, JavaScript, and many others, okay? Um, how to install and use is relatively simple. There is some learning curve, but it's relatively simple. Uh, in, in R, you will do install.packages plotly, and basically then you load the package, and that's it. Now, one thing to bear in mind is, Plotly is, 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 uh, is in very active development every, every single time. So they change versions quite, simple, quite, quite frequently. And sometimes things that work in a previous version don't work in a new version uh, or a newer version. So back compatibility is kind of so-so. Okay, uh, just bear, in, bear that in mind, check which is the version that you have. My examples I've seen are robust enough that will work with older or newer versions of Plot-D, um, but something sometimes break, okay, or are at least different. Now, Plot-D, and we're going to see this more uh, in detail, because it pushes the library, it pushes the plot into the browser. And again, this depends how you use it, okay? I, I may say something else about our studio in a second, uh, but if you are using through the R terminal, the R console, the pure R thing, it will basically push it to your browser. Um, but they also offer, that is the free part, they also offer a hosting service, uh, which is also free. You need to create a, an account with Plotly and it will, it will allow you to publish your plots in the web space. I don't usually use that, and, I, and you will see why in a second. I prefer to keep my things local, and if I, even I had to do to publicly share something, I, I do it in a different manner. One of the things that you will see, I, I will show you in a second, is whenever you create these plots, uh, the data is also part of the plot. So if you decide to put this outside in the internet, in a web page, in your lab page, in your own space or whatever, uh, people will have access to the data. And, and, and that's okay. I usually do everything open. So my publications, everything contain open data and open source uh, scripts, but it's something that you have to be aware about the privacy of your data, of course. Uh, so this, this brings me to the point that there are two modes of operation, online and offline. I usually use offline and all the examples I show you will work off, offline. But if you decide to do online, you will need to do a couple more of things. You will need to create an account with them and then create a token that your scripts will recognize and push your plot to, to the cloud service they provide. Okay. Uh, I think I mentioned this, they have tons, tons of examples and magnificent plots. I invite you to take a look, uh, a look at them from very simple ones to very advanced ones. They keep growing every day, including more features. Now you can plot on top of maps, things like that. I can show you an example of something I did as well. Um, it's, it's, it's huge. It's, it's growing incredibly fast as well. 
Uh, I, these are comments for the for the online mode, but again, I, I, I leave them there in case that you are interested. You you let me know, and I can I can tell you more about that. Um, now, one of the things uh, someone was Saina, I was asking, it was asking about ggplot. One of the things that Plotly uses is also ggplot. So underneath it can it can harvest from ggplot plots. It can use their own plotting tools, as we're going to see examples of both. Um, but but they uses a couple of other libraries that you will have to install when you start uh, and and because of that let me just give you a quick crash introduction to shishi plot I, I i mentioned that i not usually when i do my plots i usually do using basic r um sometimes sometimes i find trouble trying to customize things on shishi plot but shishi plot is a very nice tool as well especially for plotting many things were just out of the box. It tries to shrink the, the margins and white spaces in your plot. It creates good looking plots, but very, very standard way of, 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 of doing this. But the way it works is you actually have a series of commands that works in a very object oriented manner. Basically you define your data and then you add operators to the data that will create plots. So for instance, if A here is my data, uh, then I can start to add things like a curve, I can start to add a path, a polygon, um, ribbons, lines, uh, all kinds of different things. This is kind of a cheat sheet um, for ggplot, but it basically shows you the spirit of how ggplot works. You create an object where you define what the data is, where it's coming from, and then you do plus something else. So you can create box plots in this way, you can create bar charts, you can create dot plots or box plots, uh, violin charge, which are super cool, uh, and all kind of things. So it, it's, you will see I have a couple of examples, uh, but just this is to give you a teaser of what uh, of the way that Shishi plot uh, works usually. Okay. Now, okay, let's get started with the examples. Um, for this, again, I'm going to try to combine. Let me see how this goes. So I'm going to keep my slides uh, somewhere over here. And I'm going to bring my terminal back here. So all the examples that you will see are, uh, I have them as, as scripts. So I'm going to um, probably source them. And then in a second, I'm going to try to bring the place where the plot is going to, poop, uh, to pop light. So this is a simple example. Let me, let me show this in the slides first. Um, Maybe I can I can even show this um, in the call here. So this is um, so this is the same code that is on the slides here on the right side on the terminal. Basically, what this start is doing is loading the Plotly uh, library. Defining a data frame. So this is a way, a way to define basically data frame where there are three columns, a supplement for vitamin C, the dose that was prescribed uh, for how long was administered that dose. Uh, we have orange juice or vitamin C as, as a supplement for vitamin C. And then what I'm going to use is a CC plot command. Okay, so we are going to, um, let me copy and paste instead of sourcing so you guys can see what is happening here. Uh, so in loading the library, I have already installed Plotly in the in the in the computer. By the way, is the font okay? Can you guys see the font in the in the video? I hope it is okay. Cool, thanks, Peter. And so I define my data frame. So date n is the data frame. As I say, it's a different way of defining. It pretends being uh, reading data from a file, but basically it's, it's, it's like defining a data frame. And then what I'm going to use is the ccplot cc command, where the data is coming from this data frame called date n. And then the aesthetics define what is going to be my x and y coordinates. So in this case, x is the dose and y is the length for how long it was, it was prescribed. Then one of the cool things that you can do easily with uh, ccplot is group things. So the group is going to be provided by the supplement, which is orange juice or vitamin C, and the color is also being provided by the column supplement. So each, each data point will, will be two different colors, either if it is orange juice or vitamin C. Then I'm going to add lines to the representation and then points, okay? And that is my ccplot command. So if I do this, this is how my, my plot in ccplot looks like. 
Again, it's a standard plot in the sense it has some things that are different. As I say, ggplot tries to do a good job with the machines. It does this line representation, the colors, the labels, um, and all the other things that we, we discussed before. But this is still a static plot. It's similar to the concept that we saw with the plot that we did in last class. OK, how we convert this into an interactive plot and where the magic and the awesomeness comes into place? Well, because we are just dealing with a ggplot plot, we can use ggplotli is a function provided by the plotli library. And then if I do this, what is going to happen, you didn't see that because it popped up in my browser, but I'm going to bring it here. So that's the, the window that pop up in my browser. So this is my browser, actually Safari. And what happened is it's almost the same plot that you were seeing before, but the difference is now when I hop into the points, when I move my, my mouse on top of the points, now I get information of the data of the points for each single point. I can turn off things, like if I click on the legend, I can turn off the orange juice representation or the vitamin C representation. I can zoom in into regions, double click to zoom out. I can pam, um, there's a way, sorry, there's a way to, to move this, to pam, to displace the plot up and down. If I mess up things badly, I can go always back to reset access. Um, so in that sense, now it's an interactive plot. I can go and inspect the data. In this case, it's a simple data set. There is not too much enlightening happening there, but you, I hope that you guys can see the opportunity of doing something, something's really interesting with that. So in that way is what I mean with, with an interactive plot. And it's super simple to create. Now, one of the things I told you, let me show you this, is I'm going to show you, the, the, this is nothing else than a HTML document. It's something that you will be browsing in the internet. Actually, you can see the location. This is a location on my computer. You can see it's file, private, blah, blah, blah. It's on the actual computer where I'm running things. But the thing I want to show you is I'm going to show you the source code of the page. And the thing that you will see here in a second is that the data is embedded there. Um, so you can see these are the points, the values. So in this case, again, it's, it's, it's mock data. It's nothing too profound, nothing too sensitive. But if you were dealing, sometimes I, I, I teach this, this is a class for medical students and sometimes there are privacy issues with medical data, either because there are patient indi indicators or, 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 or because you just don't want to make the data public yet, you need to be aware that the data is part of the document itself, okay? Then at the very top of the, of the document, you can see that there are the calls to some particular JavaScript libraries, the Plotly JavaScript library was telling you about. So this will have some um, loading uh, functions that the browser uses for displaying these things in this way. Yeah. Anyway, too many technical details perhaps. But so that's the important thing to, to bear in mind is when you do, or when you make this public, in this particular case, it's on my computer, so it's not being public. But if you made this public by uploading to somewhere, then people will not only have access to this interactive version of the plot, but will also have access to the actual data that you use to create the plot. Okay. And again, this is just one simple example. Um, I hope that this is interesting for you guys. Um, let me show you another one that is a little bit more, more interesting. Let me, let me find this, this example in my, in my scripts. Um, I think this is called bands. And again, this is going to use the library. Uh, it's going to create a sinusoidal function that is the blue line that you see there. But then what it's going to do is it's going to add some random noise. And this is going to be represented as a band. It can be a probability band or uncertainty band, depending on how you want to, to think about the data. And then we're going to use ggplot again. So I'm going to copy this and, and paste. I, let me actually do it in a more um, better way. <laughs> Source and the script is called bands, but it's basically executing the same, the same script that you're seeing in the slide. And one thing to bear in mind, is because Plotly is, is designed for interactive manipulation is when you run things on the script, and I show you this in a second at the end of the, of the examples today, uh, when you run things on the script, things that will pop up when you type the command. So you can see in my slides, there is the ggplotly command, which basically takes your last ggplot plot and pushes to the, to the interactive version. 
won't necessarily work. Okay, so I sourced my bands to chart and nothing happened. I'm still seeing this all interactive plot, but what I had to do again is now type shishi plot D, and now you are seeing the updated version of the plot in this case, the sinusoidal function, uh, the blue line plus the, the uh, random noise added to the blue line or the noise of the plot, however you want to call it. I can turn off the noise if I want. I can turn off uh, the sinusoidal function. I can zoom in in a particular region of the function. I can uh, displace my, my access. Uh, I can mess up things. I can, I can go back to, to my original uh, description. You can add some uh, lines if you want for adding uh, the viewer. Uh, you can uh, do comparisons as well. Um, it's, again, it's a lot of functionalities for interactive visualization, interactive exploration of the data. Okay, any questions so far? You guys liking it? Resonating with some of you? Maybe not. <laughs> I always get too excited when, when with these things. Uh, this is another example. Again, there are a few examples that utilize the advantage of, of, of Shishi plot. Um, in this case, I think it's called, uh, how, how did I call this one? I think it's called points or something. Um, points. I used to have a list, sorry. Let me see where I have it. Sherman. Bands, point lines, I think. Yeah. I think this is the one I'm looking for. Let me see. Yeah. So again, this is, and again, most of these examples, as you can see in my notes, are taken from the Plotly documentation site. And again, I invite you, we, we can look at that in a second if you wish. Um, but most of these things are coming from uh, the Plotly documentation site. And again, you can see here the commands are being executed. P was the object I created to define the things, but nothing happened until I, I issued the command plot D, GC plot D, and now we have an interactive version of the actual plot uh, that was created in the static world. And again, you, you, you can play with this, you can zoom in into a particular region, zoom out, etc. Okay. What is left is a few different examples. For instance, we can see how to come or, or turn into life. Um, Box plots, usually box plots are cool plots to represent um, some, some statistical um, um, quantities, uh, but they are quite, quite static in most of the cases. Uh, let me see if I have the static version of the, um, where did it go? Uh, it didn't show up in my static plot, that's weird. Okay, let's, let's use the, the interactive one. So this is an interactive representation of a box plot. Usually you get this plot and not much more than that. But now if you hop onto the box plot, you get information for the value of the median, the third quantile, the first quantile, upper fence, maximum, lower fence, and minimum of the outliers, which are outlier points, as you can see. So again, another interest, interesting uh, visualization of box plot. You can, of course, customize your box plot with colors. Uh, that's what the, the other example does. So it's same box plot if you wish, but now it's customized with color. That's a feature of Shishi plot, but actually, you know, it pop a little bit more when you do it with, with plot lead, I found. And um, finally, again, another feature from, from Shishi plot is you can, you can um, flip the axis if you want. And uh, uh, in that case, the, the, the box plot will look something like that. And, and, and they automatically update the flipping of the labels for each of the indicators in the box plot. So again, it's something that is, is uh, I, I found to, to be interesting. These are the examples again, and the snippets of the code for each of them, okay? Um, let me see, a couple more of examples with a probability distribution functions. Um, in this case, the sample is a little bit more, more with more lines, but it's mostly because it's defining information. It's, it's just the data that is being generated and, 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 and created a data frame. But the plotting, the plotting commands are just the usual one. Shishi plot, uh, in this case, we're using the density function. 
and with some transparency, that's what the alpha, alpha parameter there defines, and then she should plot the... Now, one thing to show you here, so let me show you this example, is, um, let me show you this, this snippet of the code also in the terminal. Uh, this is called multiple density curves. So this is the same example as you see in the screen, but one thing you notice here, what I'm doing is I'm creating this file name, okay? So by doing that, so let's, let's source this command. Um, it was called uh, multiple density curves. Okay, so it executed. Again, if I want to see this interrupted, I use ccplotli and I can see the density in a second. So my two density probability functions in this case for carrot and cube and same features as before, turning off things, turning it on, all the, all the nice things that we discussed about that. But the other interesting thing, let's go back to the terminal. If I exit my terminal now, and I look at the files, there should be a file called, um, what do we call this? Sorry. Uh, all surfaces, um, what I call this? Oh no, sorry, this is a different one. We're going to see that example in a second, multiple density curves, sorry. And looking for the snippet of the code. There we go. So I call this uh, file name multiple density curves. So you can see here, multiple. there is a PNG file that was also generated. Um, there we go. That was also generated by that. Okay, so when you do ccplotli with the file name, you can, you can take a snapshot, but the most interesting part um, I'm not seeing the file here, so I'm not sure where it uh, probably put in on my home directory. Let me see. Uh, no, no. Okay, I show you that in a second. But the most interesting part is you can actually say this representation in, in HTML. Okay, so that is uh, one of the examples I have for you. Let me see. This is another example, very similar one to the one that we just did. Um, but I want to show you also how you can store this as an HTML document and the different options that you have for saving this. Um, a few more examples with probability densities, uh, two-dimensional scatter plot. Um, again, there is no much going on. Okay, let's take a look at this one though, uh, because there is a different way of doing things. And this will help a little bit with this issue of not popping up things. So I'm going to source this one is called um, I think it's called 2D density scatter. Yeah. Let's source. So uh, this, this uh, script contains exactly the code that you're seeing on the slides. Now, what I'm going to do, uh, you can see I assign the CC plot function to a variable called P. So if I call P now, what happens is my CC plot function will pop up. Okay, and that's the CC plot function. Again, no interacting, no dynamics whatsoever. It's a static representation. But now what I can do, this is called the handler of the plot, similar to what we discussed with the handler of the file. What I can do is now invoke CC plot Lee on the variable P, on the handler of the CC plot plot. And now I will have my CC plot plot interact in iterative version. And you can see the different dots here, the different ISO contour levels. Again, all this was produced with CC plot, uh, but plot is taking advantage of that. You can zoom in a particular region and then zoom out. One thing you may notice or not, I'm not sure, is my, my computer, my browser in particular, has started to be a little bit uh, lagging. It's starting to get a little bit slow. My, my, my fan is, is, is speeding up. And this is because these JavaScript libraries sometimes are, are a bit of power, power consumption is high. So a little bit of, of power, power eager. Uh, so I'm going to start to close. I'm going to start closing some tabs here just for for keeping some some freedom in the in the computer to do some more things. Okay, just a warning. In some cases, it can it can lead to these issues. Um, any questions so far?
Okay, so far what we have seen is utilize CC plot to produce some plots. But one of the limitations in most of the libraries, in, in uh, plotting libraries in R, is that they are uh, two dimensional at most. And we talked about this last class or class before when we talked about the 3D scatter plot. But Plotly offers also three dimensional plotting capabilities and they are super cool. So let me show you that. And then we talk about how to save your plots into HTML documents if you wish. So let me go to the slides. Uh, so these are the examples, these are surface representations. Um, remember the word volcano data that we use for one of the examples of the professional plotting um, or professional quality plots? We're going to do that and we're going to do it using uh, sorry, Plotly. So I'm going to source my example called, um, I think this is called, let's see, surfaces.r. And surfaces.r is this, this file here. It has, let's take a quick peek at this one. So it has three definitions, um, P surface, P contours, and then KD, KD 3D. And each of them are a particular representation. So P surface is what we have here. It's using plot underscore Lee. It's a function from Plotly. It's using as the set variable for representing this surface, the volcano data, the topographical data of the volcano. And then the type of plot we want to produce is a surface. It's a surface representation. So I'm assigning this to a variable. So now I can do P surface. And when I do that, now in my browser, it will show the representation of the volcano data. And this is how it looks like. It's, it's nice looking already, but the real cool and thing uh, to bear in mind is now if I hop with my browser, it draw the, um, draws the ISO contours in the three possible variables, X, Y, and Z. But if I click and drag, now I can rotate the thing. I can zoom in into the volcano. I can rotate again, zoom out. Uh, it's, it, I, again, I found it to be really, really nice way of representing and visualizing data for data exploration. Okay, so that is when you represent data, three-dimensional data in a surface or a mesh representation. There is another one that I created called p-contours. And one thing to notice is now this is a variable. So I can either call the variable or do print. And if I do print p-contours, there's a method associated to that that basically does exactly the same. It's the same as calling the variable, but I, rem I, I, I remark this because if you're running this on a script and you put the name of the variables, it won't do anything, but you can do always print of the variable and then it will show up. Now, this is the same data, it's the volcano data, but it's the isosurface, so also called isocontours of the data, where you can go into the data, get the X, Y, Z values. The values in Z are also used for color coding the, the uh, altitude or height of, of the volcano. And the same things that we did before, zoom in, zoom out. Um, you can reset things. You can, you can displace uh, the coordinates if you need to, uh, and you can reset it. So it's very, very nice for interactive visualization, okay? Uh, the, third, the third plot I have is called KD 3 d This again is a surface representation coming from data taken from a different library, a mass library. It's another representation, three-dimensional representation, just to show how, how nicely, how easy it is to do this kind of visualizations with, with Plotly, okay? It's a final example I, I, I want to show you is you can create actually, and let me close this once again, because it's starting to get a little bit demanding on my, on my system, is you can create multiple uh, surface representations. In this case, I'm defining the matrix C with a set of given values. And then what I'm going to do is a representation of this surface, but then I'm going to create a, a couple of additional surfaces with a given offset, if you wish, in the set direction. Uh, but just to show you that um, that this is 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 just possible to to do that uh, multiple surfaces. That's the script and and uh, what we want now is the plot loop. So this basically will show. Oops, what happened there? 
Okay, something didn't like. Let me take a look at this. This is script again. Uh, oh, sorry. I call this mod surfaces. Mod surfaces. And uh, now we will have a main plane or a main surface. And actually, I don't know if you noticed this. This <laughs> I, I forgot about this. Um, again, the, the ISO contours are there. There should be two more uh, surfaces. This is uh, incompatibility with the Mozilla, uh, sorry, with the Safari browser. Um, let me launch my um, Firefox one. I believe that will work. What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to launch Firefox and I'm copying the location of the temporary file that are created for representing this, this surface. And Firefox is taking some time to load. I close the thing. And you will see uh, with Firefox, you will be able to see this representation, I hope. Um, usually, this is something where I notice in the latest versions of Plotly. I'm not sure why is it doing it. Um, now my, my, my Firefox is loading. Hopefully, we will have the three bands or the three surfaces there. It's taking some time. There it goes. There you go. <laughs> That's another fun thing, the transparency. So the first surface and the last surface should be 10% transparent or 90% transparent, 10% opacity, and you're not seeing it. Again, these are some, some, we are already doing very, very advanced stuff with these visualization techniques, and, and probably Chrome may do a better job. Um, but again, don't be surprised. They probably will fix this back in next editions. Um, yeah, it's related to how the JavaScript libraries are interpreted. But at least you can see how the, the, the visualization uh, continues on this one. Okay. It's exactly the same file, the same plot, but now the, the browser is, is, is visualizing, is rendering things, the, uh, things slightly different. Okay. So. That's, I think, is my last example for uh, the interactive visualization. Let me go back to the full screen mode. Um, any questions so far? Just one final thing. I think we have a few more minutes. One final thing I want to mention is I, I, I comment about this a uh, um, few minutes ago is how to say the interactive visualization as an HTML document. And this is the thing you want, you, if you want to push this into your own web page or into a document within your web space or something, that's the thing you will need uh, to keep these this interactive features of the plots alive. So what you need to do is to use the HTML widgets library. So that one is an additional library. Uh, at some point it used to come with um, Plotly, I think now is, is not mandatory. So you may need to install this library as well. Um, and the way it works is you will use the say widget function and then ask dot widget and then the handler to your plot. Now, the handler to your plot is this variable I was assigning uh, before to some of the examples. And then you will give uh, uh, the, the file a name. Okay. So you will call plot Lee function and then assign that to a variable. And that is what it goes in the handler of your plot. Now, a uh, couple of comments. Um, and again, this changes depending on the version of Plotly that you are using and the version of HTML widget that you are using. Um, by default, what, what the say widget function will do, if let's say that we call our, our file your underscore graph.html, what it will do is it will create an HTML document, but it also will create a your underscore graph underscore files directory or folder containing all the JavaScript libraries that we discussed at the beginning, Plotly needs to work. So these are the ones that allow the, the browser to load the functions that allow to do the rotation, the visualization, the displays of the data, uh, and so on. Okay. Now, there is a version where instead of doing this, uh, the HTML file is only one file. It's a huge file because it contains embedded within the HTML document, all this information. So there are two possibilities here. Either you do this and you keep your, your um, JavaScript libraries in a separate subdirectory, 
or you include everything in one single HTML file, but the size is, is quite bulky, it's quite large, okay? Um, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's mostly it. Um, final comments for this is, as I mentioned, Plotly is a package that is in very active development, uh, which is good, by the way, I think. It's open source, so you can go to the web page and, 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 and uh, to the Git repository, actually, and see the actual code. Um, and the examples uh, are, are a lot. There are a lot of examples available, so it's, it's a good place to go for reference, I would, I would recommend. Uh, so I have a, a couple of links here. Um, in particular, links to the Shiny package. So the Shiny package is another package. We're not going to discuss this. But let's say now that you have a model, you are visualizing this model with Plotly, and you want you have a parameter in your model that you want to change or vary, and you can put um, widgets, you can put uh, knobs in, in the visualization that allow you to change that parameter um, manually or interactively and the visualization basically represents that so the interaction between plotly and shiny is is super powerful super super nice for model visualization or or the dynamical modifications of the data if you, if you wish um i have a few more examples here uh again you can follow the example just read the the, the examples or try the examples and and things will should work if they don't just let me know um, try to include examples of different teams or different topics. But again, the, 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 the really, really good uh, place for reference is, I think, the, the Plotly website. I think I put it in, in different places. But uh, I think this one is a good place for starting um, uh, for, for uh, showing. Let me, let me bring this back, open in another browser. Uh, but this is a good place for reference for for basically almost everything you want to do with uh, with Plotly. Different different examples. Some of the examples you will you will notice from from the slides. Um, but you know you I think there was uh, one with different types of plots. I have it actually open no oh, i think instead of getting started you just go to plotty.com slash r and you will see all the type this are the one all the times all the types of different plots that you can create this is and it keeps growing growing and growing and as i say nowadays you can do um geographical representation of map, maps and data um, so you probably will find something that is close to your area of research that is maybe worth exploring. Uh, because I, I, again, I think this is a pretty neat tool. All right. Um, and if I think is all what I have for you today, uh, as I say, we have one more lecture to go next Monday. Um, I will, as I mentioned, post something on the forum in case that you guys have uh, any particular interest. Um, so I would like to, to hear from you if, you, if that's the case. Um, any questions from today or for, for the assignment that is due next, uh, next month? All right. So it looks like we don't have any questions. Uh, if that's the case, then I will I will see you uh, next Monday. We have the office hours on Friday as well. If you guys have any questions or, or issues you would like to discuss, okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. I I will see you uh, this Friday or or next Monday. Have a good one. <laughs>